welcome to the Glazov Gang. Tonight, who is killing Palestinian children? We have a very special guest with us this evening, Dr. Anna Geifman, a scholar who has taught in the History Department at Boston University for over 20 years and is now a senior researcher at the Department of Political Studies at the University of Bar Ilan in Israel. Her main areas of specialization are history and psychology of terrorism, comparative terrorism from Russia to the Middle East, and psychohistory, the use of psychology to explain historical and political issues. Her latest book is Death Orders, the Vanguard of Modern Terrorism in Revolutionary Russia. Professor Anna Geifman, what an honor and privilege it is to have you on the Glazov Gang. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we have a little connection. You were born in St. Petersburg? Yes. And I was born in Moscow. So we oba gavarim paruski. We understand each other well. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Anna, you are a specialist on death cultures and especially why terrorist movements target and sacrifice children. We see this especially in, in, what, in what Hamas is doing, in terms of what Islamic terror is doing today, and I want to discuss all of this with you. But before we begin, personally, at the moment, you are in Israel, correct? Yes, I'm in Jerusalem. Can we talk a little bit about why you're in Jerusalem and also what you're seeing with your eyes and experiencing? Okay. First of all, I live here. I've lived uh, when my family left Russia in, in 76. I was uh, I was a little girl, and then uh, I grew up in this, in the states in Boston, and I was educated there and uh, worked there for um, for many years. And then uh, several years ago, uh, I uh, made what's called Aliyah in uh, Im immigrated to to Israel, uh, and. Which, which was one of the one of the most amazing decisions of my life, and I'm uh, amazingly happy. I'm happy about this, and I live in Jerusalem, which is equally amazing. And um, uh, of course, now we are at war, basically, and uh, you know, there's no other word to to describe it. What's what needs to be said about this is that the war, even though the war is fought in the south. Uh, every single citizen is affected because the way it started was that you know Hamas began obviously to to uh, fire rocket rockets and they've been firing rockets uh, primarily in the south for years you know, some in some years more in some years less uh, there would be intensified attacks or you know relative quiet but um, uh, about two and a half weeks ago uh, we began to feel it everywhere, not just in the south, not just in Zdirot and Etivot and other places where we're used to having this, this shellings, but in the center of the, of the country, in Tel Aviv, even in the north, and, and f even in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was, real, was always extremely protected uh, because of the way that it is situated, because, because of the way it is. But uh, we've had um, sirens, and we've had attacks, and we've had explosions. Um, outside of the of the capital, uh, Dr. Geifman, what is it like emotionally and psychologically for you and for the close people around you to live under these circumstances? Um, it's stressful uh, on one level, and uh, on another level, you know, everyone is used to it. But more important, of course, it's you know, of course, people are aware. People are. Uh, glued to their television screens and then listen to, to to news reports every 15 minutes and that's what we discuss and uh, uh, of course uh, what we are what we what 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 is on the other hand what is important very very important to say that despite of the stress and despite uh, the the tension uh, I've never seen Israel as united in Israel in the sense of citizens and friends and people who are just strangers on the street, you know, everyone is talking and everyone is helping each other. I've yeah. never seen people being as nice as they are today. Right. You know, in lines and stores and, you know, people are trying their hardest to, to help each other, one another. It's absolutely amazing. Dr. Guy. And of course, everyone, everyone is, uh, everyone knows, you know, we had the, in, um, in the recent 
there was a there was a recent discussion and according to the polls you know 73 percent of the israelis are in favor not in favor of the war but in favor of finishing what needs to be done what the army needs to do and this everyone is very much behind the government behind the behind the army thank you and dr geifman everyone here at the freedom center and at front page magazine our hearts are with you and with all the israeli people uh dr geifman it's interesting and very curious how Hamas rockets have always uh, been coming into Israel, killing innocent civilians, and the world yawns. It's only when the Israelis begin to defend themselves that suddenly the world wants some kind of ceasefire. But when the Jews... You know, the situation seems to be, seems to have changed in this last war. Mm -hmm. We really feel the support. First of all, we really feel the support of the Americans. The government is, but, but for me, even the European Union yesterday there was an announcement that that they they understand that what what we're doing which is a very very important very significant very significant change from how it uh, has had been before that's a good development but in general what I'm referring to is these horrible double standards that we know are in the uh, international community uh, dr. Geifman tell us who is killing Palestinian children the Palestinian children are being killed by their own government. I'm not, of course, I'm not saying that that the Israeli army uh, had the Israeli army had as part of the operation in in Gaza. Inadvertently, soldiers have because and the, and the pilots because of the bombardment uh, are officially responsible for killing. Uh, inadvertently, again, uh, many civilians. Not because they wanted to. Okay, obviously, they, they, there's no way that anyone could say that the Israeli pilots have purposely targeted the civilians. Okay, all of them, all of the civilians who died were were uh, were uh, died because they were uh, in the areas where Hamas operates. Now, why is Hamas operating in these areas? That's that's the key question, okay? Hamas operates in these areas precisely because they're using this this uh, civilians and especially children as uh, human shields. I don't think there's one person in his right mind today who would deny this. I mean, you have to be completely brainwashed to not to see the report and not to understand what they're doing. Uh, civilians have been told repeatedly not to leave the houses, okay? Uh, to protect, quote-unquote, the houses. How can they protect the houses with the, the bare hands? It's unclear. It's clear, on the other hand, what, the, what Hamas is doing. They expect, they can't lose, basically. If the Israelis fire in these heavily populated areas, uh, children and other civilians are killed, and it's an amazing propaganda device. Okay, and we can talk about why it's so effective. Mm -hmm. We can I can explain later on why why it, why every death of a child is, is is a sensation. Okay, if the if Israelis don't fight, of course the Hamas wins because they can operate really and do what they want to do. That is far at our civilians. The difference between us and them is that we don't target civilians. We try to avoid civilian casualties. Yes, they. Yes do precisely the opposite. They target the civilians, and that's what their main tactic is. Absolutely, yes. and this is the difference between a civilization and a barbaric death culture. Dr. Geifman, tell us, you're a specialist on this, why do these evil totalitarian regimes target children and sacrifice children? And you've drawn some parallels in these death cultures of the Bolsheviks and of Islamic terrorists. Um. It's a, it's a very, very interesting parallel. By the way, you know, I didn't mention it, but this is what happens by the, that's what, the, the, civilians become first victims every time terrorists come to power. And we have, we've seen two examples of this. The first example was in Russia when the Bolsheviks came to power in 1917. Uh, and, uh, uh, typically when I say this, people protest and say, well, what about uh, the French Revolution? If obviously it's not, the, it's not Lenin, it's not the Bolsheviks who have coined the word terror 
not Lenin, but Robespierre. He was the, you know, the, the Jacobins have established the regime of terror. The difference, and the reason why I say that the Bolsheviks were the first to, to, uh, to, to first terrorists to come to power, is that during the French Revolution, the Jacobins didn't come to power as terrorists. They became, they, be, they began to use terror as part of their administration, as part of their regime, but they, they had not been terrorists prior to uh, coming to power. Whereas the Bolsheviks had used terrorists repeatedly. It was very part of their uh, operation methods. And, and when they came to power, they began to rely on terrorism on something that they knew what to do, on, on their past practices and began to build on them, began, began to build their terror-based regime on uh, in Russia for the entire for the population as a whole. Okay, this is the first time in human history. Second, of course, the Taliban's tried it back in the uh, back in the day, but they were thrown out of power. Um, the second time was when in 2006 Hamas terrorists came to power. As a, as the difference between them and the Bolsheviks was that the, that, that the Bolsheviks usurped power. They 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 came to power as a result of a takeover. Hamas were elected. Hamas was elected by the, the Gazans, by 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 the by by their population in free some people say semi democratic elections, but for, for for as far as we know, they were regular, normal, more or less democratic elections. Now the, so they so if you if you want to talk about the parallel, historical parallel, we can uh, we can make it with Hitler, who back in 1933, of course, was elected by the Germans, okay, in free elections. All right. So if so if we want to talk about the historical parallel, the, the, it is with um, with the way German the Germans have had elected their government in 1933, uh, and were responsible just as the as the Palestinians they are responsible for what for for, for whom they choose now. I'm not saying killing civilians in Gaza. The fact that children die there is not a tragedy. No one likes it, but it's very important to to to, to emphasize who holds responsibility for this. Okay, it's the government that uses and abuses its populations, that that uses them as as, as human shields, uh, as that. Um, that uh, holds its own population hostage. And if we want to talk about the Palestinian children, the parallel, the analogy is with Hitler, Hitler Jugend. Children, 12, 10 to 12 year olds who were in, in 1945 thrown against the Russian tanks with hand grenades to protect uh, the, Nazi, uh, the Nazi regime. That's the parallel. Okay, Dr. Geifman, before we get to the last two questions, our time is running out, I just want to uh, clarify something with you. Um, because in our view, the Obama administration has been a disgrace in terms of how it's abandoned Israel and bullied Israel and betrayed Israel in many ways and, you know, in, in many respects reached its hand out in solidarity to this death culture. When you said that things are getting a little bit better in terms of who's supporting Israel, what did you mean? From the world community, you feel a little bit of extra support I right now? I think we feel, we feel that maybe, we hope, yeah. that maybe, yeah. you know, pe people start to, people have seen enough of Hamas. Right, okay. It, it's impossible not to see that they are terrorists, right. that all the, all the trouble of the, of the people in Gaza come from them. Just, you know, Russian history. Okay. Uh, who are the first victims? And, and, and this is the, this is true about any totalitarian regime. The first victims of terrorists in power is their own population. Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you, Dr. Geifman. Perhaps it's for another time and place. Some people are beginning to see, of course, <coughs> thankfully. I just wanted to, to see what your thoughts were because in terms of what the Obama administration is doing, we really believe that They've really, really got betrayed Israel and that Kerry and Obama, if they did the right thing, they would be supporting the Israelis right now to crush Hamas completely. But we have just three minutes left. Dr. Geifman, let's center in a little bit on why children especially are targeted and sacrificed by these cultures of death 
that you would see a parallel between Bolsheviks and Islamic terrorists. Why children, as we saw in Beslan, for instance? Why, what do children represent to these death cultures? Uh, children are the last uh, unquestionable value of the Western world. In this world of, of pluralism and rel relativism and, uh, and uh, conflicting values and, you know, on one side and on the other side and all that, children are, are, are the last absolute, okay? And this is where terrorists try uh, strike. Okay, they strike it. It was the most sacred and was indisputable. Really, I cannot think of any other immutable value in the Western world today, and they know it. Okay, while they sacrifice their own children. Okay, and they, perhaps it's a, it's a topic for discussion for another time. Why they do this? Right. But right. they know about us. That for us, this is the last absolute. Mm -hmm. There's no. On the other hand, it's not nice to kill children, but there's no such thing. And it's the last, this is the last value that, that we hold sacred, and this is where they strike. And this is um, how they traumatize, actually, the victim peoples who they're attacking because it's so traumatic that in their nihilism they do such unthinkable things. You write in your work, and by the way, all of our viewers should go and read uh, Dr. Geifman's article, Who is Killing Palestinian Children? and all of her wonderful articles at frontpagemag.com, and it's an honor to run your work, Dr. Geifman. Thank you. But you write that children are our connection to the future, a link to immortality. By attacking children, terrorists seek to destroy life as is and life to be. So in other words, it's also an attack on the future because they also reject the future. It's, it, is, it is an attack on life. When they say that they love death more than we love life, it's not a euphemism, it's not a metaphor, they mean it. And it's very hard for, for normal people, for, for those people who, who choose life as opposed to death, to understand the stability. They think they just, they're, no, they can't really mean that. They do. It's a death-worshipping cult. They love death, they venerate death. They serve it and they sacrifice to death. And like in every, there have been many death cults in, in world history. Children are, are the, the main sacrifices. And, it's been, and Dr. Geifman, and in Israel, you are facing this enemy that's attacking children and sacrificing children. They're attacking Israeli children and also their own children. Absolutely. That's why it's so. That's why it's absolutely essential to to understand who we're dealing with. It's not a political issue, only on the surface it is, but it's much more than a political issue. It's not even a psychological issue. Definitely not a territorial issue. They've said it's it's a, it's a it's a it's a spiritual issue. It's a form of dark spiritual spirituality that we're dealing with. Absolutely. And Dr. Geifman, only under a minute. I'm sorry, we've run out of time. I wish we could talk to you for another few hours. But under 60 seconds, Dr. Geifman, if you could say something, the world is watching. What would you ask of the world right now if it could help Israel? What does the world need to do to help Israel? Uh, first of all, let us do the job. Let, we understand the situation more than anyone else. We are here. We understand what's going on. Uh, we're doing everything to minimize uh, the suffering on both sides, but we know we are, we, we really, we've dealt with them before. We know exactly who they are. Let us deal with them, okay? And of course, uh, of course, it's very important for us that the world would look at us objectively, without any, without, uh, without uh, any biases. Really look at the situation. Really try to look at the, to see. You know, look at look at the you know w what the two sides are. You know, look at the you know in the in the in the postmodern culture, the world the word evil is is not very accepted. We don't, you know people don't like to say good and evil because they don't believe in absolutes. But you know what? There is that that there are such things as good and evil, 
And it's very important to, to, to define those things as they are and not to, not to blur the, the, the reality. Okay. Dr. Geifman, thank you so much. It was an honor to have you on the Glazov Gang. It's an honor to have you writing for Front Page Magazine. I'm very familiar with your work. All of our viewers should get Dr. Geifman's book, Death Orders, The Vanguard of Modern Terrorism in Revolutionary Russia. And Dr. Geifman, thank you that with so much courage and nobility that you shine a light on the truth and that you expose the evil in our world today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you take care over there, and all of our prayers and thoughts are with you and with the Israeli people. Thank you. This is very important to us. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for watching The Glass Off Gang. We'll see you next week. Good night.